All right, and I'm back. Okay. No, appreciate you joining me today. I mean, I've been really excited to talk to you ever since I you know, kind of found out about Johnson Island and have talked to a few people who've worked there. So it's a really interesting topic, and it's incredible to me that so little people know about it, but yet so many people have been there. And I don't know if you have listened to many of my shows, but I interviewed a homeless veteran who at one point had spent time on Johnson Island. And that's how I got interested in the subject. And he mentioned that for him, in the Army in the 70s, he was stationed in Hawaii, and then they took a C-130 from Hawaii to Johnson Island, but they had to dress in full chem warfare gear. And then when they got there, they were playing around in the, in the sand and on the beach and doing little maneuvers and things. And, you know, he thought it was kind of strange that that was the case. But now that I talked to you and a couple of other people and done my own research, it makes a whole lot of sense to me why they would ask him to be in Kim Warfare gear to go to Johnson Island. So I'd like to just hear your story from the beginning of how you went there, how long you were there, and some of the things you witnessed. And then I'd like to ask you a couple of questions, if that's all right. Sure. Um, I, I think J.I. Johnson Island um, has three chapters to it, all right? I'm in the second chapter. The person that you referenced earlier that went there in the 70s, he's in the third chapter. The first chapter, is it was used as a, a location for atmospheric and um, actual uh, uh, nuclear weapons bombs that were dropped maybe uh, – 30,000 feet above the island. Um, they used it as a point to record um, the effects of the atomic bomb. That went on up until around 1961. After for that point from 61 to when I got there, and I got there in 1967, J.I. was a top secret uh, base that uh, had Thor nuclear rockets situated on the island for the sole purpose of destroying um, satellites in the, orbiting uh, the Earth. Um, I got there in 1967, and uh, I was attached to, uh, actually it was attachment to 18 surveillance squadron, uh, and our job was to track satellites. Uh, that was the first part of our job. The second part of our job was to measure the location of those satellites, feed the information to Cheyenne Mountain for targeting if necessary. All right. Um, when I first got to the island, uh, I was totally amazed at what was not there. It was just a coral reef. It was tiny. It was a, it was a quarter mile by a half mile at that time. It since has been expanded upon and by, by dredging up the coral reef and making it a little bit uh, larger so larger planes could land there. But um, so, you know, my mission was basically, I was a crew chief. Uh, there was six people on my crew and we had our satellite tracking station uh, about a half mile off the main island, a little island called Sand Island. All right. Sand Island was also inhabited by a uh, Coast Guard Loran station to man the Loran Towers as a beacon for shipping in the area. And I believe aircraft too. Uh, Sand Island was only about maybe, um, I'm gonna say about uh, 50 yards by about 200 yards, really tiny, okay? Sand Island was, was added upon and my installation, my little building was built on top of the actual waste from a launch pad that was demolished in 1964 when a Thor rocket, fully nuclear tipped Thor rocket, exploded in the launch pad. At that time, the, the, uh, the wisdom was, we'll, we'll just chew up the launch pad, we'll dump part of it in the sea, and we'll use part of it to expand Sand Island. And the, uh, the superstructure that was part of the launch pad Rather than demolishing that and getting rid of it, what they did was they simply painted over it. So all this radioactivity uh, that had saturated that launch pad was spread throughout the entire island and also supplemented on places like Sand Island. We didn't know this. 
We did not have to wear any type of uh, radiation badges. No one mentioned anything about any type of accidents that had taken place just three years before I got there. And so it was all pretty hush-hush. Um, even, even my particular job as crew chief, um, we only were, I was only uh, apprised of some of the missions um, when I got on site for my particular tour. I mean, it was pretty, it was pretty top secret. And I, I've since found out that the reason for the secrecy was that there was a nuclear test ban treaty. And the location of JI was in violation of that test ban treaty. So it had to be kept quiet. Um, I remember one night in particular, we were, uh, we were told we were gonna have a live launch from the main island, which again was about a half mile away. And we had been tracking a particular item that was uh, you know, large in size and we had to target it. We had to feed the information to Cheyenne Mountain. We were told they were gonna try and take it down. And uh, it was, I was on the midnight, the midnight shift. And around two o'clock in the morning, uh, we got the, the warning that there's gonna be a, a launch within an hour and we had the countdown and uh i was standing uh in our building and the roof of our building opened up to expose the the device that we use to track satellites it was an optical device um and the uh the horns blared uh lights flashed and the missile took off and everything shook i felt like it was the end of the world this was a huge thor rocket and after about maybe, oh, I'd say to a minute to a minute and a half, the entire sky lit up, yellow, orange, green, multiple colors. So you knew that there was a nuclear explosion. And in effect, it was right above JI and right above my little sand island. Um, next night, we started the mission again. And we tracked and looked for that particular item that we gave targeting information for, and it was gone. So the mission was a success. Whatever that object was, whether it was a dummy object or a Russian object, it was gone. So the mission was completed. Um, nothing unusual happened about the island. It was, again, there was a, uh, an isolated place at that time there were no women on the island at all okay um, the only things that we did for enjoyment were we used to lift weights uh, we played softball on a coral a, a coral a baseball field there was no grass at the time um, one of the best features though was the uh, the mess hall was manned by a company by the name of uh, Holmes and Narver they provided security on the island and they had the best mess hall, mess hall in the entire Air Force I mean, we had filet mignon. I mean, it was just, food was just incredible. It was, it was like a, a, a five-star restaurant almost. And, uh, and then we had an, an outdoor uh, uh, movie theater. Uh, and because we were in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, we would have to bring our ponchos because quite often than not, it would rain during the actual showing of a movie. Um, after my year's tour was up, uh, I was sent back to... Uh, to the States, to another location where we were also tracking. This was a, uh, actually a little part in, uh, in Florida down south in a, pl a place called Jupiter, uh, which has since grown into a huge, a huge population area. But uh, that was it. There was no, uh, at that time, they weren't storing any, any uh, biological weapons on the island. That started, I believe, in 1969. They started shipping stuff from uh from vietnam to the island and, and i wasn't there at that time and it, in the 70s it, it became uh much more um a, a location for for dumping all these nuclear weapons this third phase of johnson island was the phase where this individual you're talking about probably was involved with where it was the mission of the island to actually destroy all those chemical and biological weapons they built a, 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 they built one of the very first plants used to destroy that weaponry. But even at that time, um, they, they also started to scrape the island's uh, coral soil and put it off on, a, on a, uh, another extended part of the island 
And that's where they kept the radioactive plutonium soil. Uh, while I was there, we walked on it, we played softball on it. Um, I scuba dived in the area, in the lagoon around the island, which is where they dumped again, a lot of that debris from uh, that explosion in 64. And by the way, there was also an explosion, I believe in 62 on the island. So there were, there were two, act, two actually, uh, Thor rockets detonated on the island, plus, you know, years, years past, maybe five to 10 years before that, uh, the actual detonations of uh, weapons um, above the island. Yeah, that's an incredible story. I've read about some of the kind of testing that went on there, and it just blows my mind that uh, nuclear weapons were tested and there's just plutonium everywhere and nobody really thinks anything about it. No, granted, at that time, I know that they're probably, they had a different understanding of the half-life and some of the long-lasting effects than what they do now. But you had to have some kind of indication, I would think, that maybe that's not healthy. Do you think that they had any idea? I think that they knew that it was very unhealthy. Um, to what extent they knew or to what damage it would cause, I don't know. Um, you know, all I know is that uh, we, we knew nothing about it. We knew nothing about the accident in 64. Um, we, again, we weren't told to wear any type of uh, radiation badges at all. And so, um, you know, I, I think from my perspective, I, I enlisted in the Air Force in 66. I wasn't drafted. Um, I liked my job. I, I felt that uh, we were doing an important service. Um, you know, granted, uh, you know, uh, so many people went over to Vietnam and actually served in Vietnam in country. And so many people, people that I know, got killed. Um, the work that I did, even though it was very secret, uh, I knew it was extremely important because it was the arms race. It was a, it was a missiles race at the time. Uh, there was a Cold War going on. Uh, Russia had satellites in space, and I'm sure we did. Uh, we had, you know, orbiting uh, uh, stations that could fire. Um, so I felt that I, you know, I, I, I was really proud of my service. But what I think made me uh, begin to become very angry was probably about 10 years ago. When, and, and by the way, I, I use the VA healthcare system here in San Diego. Uh, I think it's the greatest in the country. I've never had a problem with it. Um, 10 years ago, uh, they ran a bone, a bone density test on me. And uh, they found that I had something called osteopenia, which is a, a weakening of the bone structure, usually caused by you know very, very tiny holes in your bone, which Renders, renders them not as strong as they could be. And I asked, you know, well, what, what do you think caused that? And they, they said, well, we don't know. It can happen as you get older. It can also be caused by radiation exposure. I didn't think, you know, anything about it until three years ago when I had an episode where uh, I was getting dizzy spells. And so they sent me to get an MRI and they found two tumors on my brain, um, small in size, not enough at this particular point in time that they wanted to go ahead and perform any type of neurosurgery because who wants to go through brain surgery unless you have to. Um, and so I asked, well, what could have caused that? And again, the answer came back, plutonium, ionized radiation. Uh, I put two and two together and felt like, wow, so now I've got a problem with my bones. Now I've got a problem with two tumors in my brain. And it's pointing to the fact that I was sitting on an island, and in particular, my little sand island, uh, where they actually dumped some of the, the uh, material from the explosion in 64, three years before I got there. Um, and this could have been caused by that. And so I submitted a claim to the VA. And uh, after about a year uh, of waiting and submitting all paperwork, uh, heavy, heavy documentation of what the island uh, has in terms of the, the radioactive content, and the claim was denied. Um, you know, I had a choice to go ahead and hire an attorney to continue the process. Um, and that's when I got involved with the group on Facebook of all the other vets that were on Johnson Island. And I've noticed an important, an important similarity between all of us. Everyone who submitted the claim 
was denied. People who had cancer, people who had leukemia, people who had bone cancer, all different types of infirmity, all different types of, of, of illnesses, they were all denied on their claim. And um, so at that point, what I try to do is to organize them somehow, but it's really tough to do and you know, it's, it's all digital and they're in different parts of the earth. And some of the, some of the guys are, in fact, some of the guys are a little bit older than I am. They're in their 80s now. I'm only in my early 70s. And, um, but two people that I was stationed with on the island died. Uh, one died of stomach cancer uh, two years ago. Uh, and the other guy died of, uh, um, he had another type of cancer. I think it was a blood cancer. He died of that. So uh, if there was a way of exposing the exposure that that the the government allowed the you know guys that you know knew nothing about the the dangers of the island, uh, but yet they're suffering. I, you know, I, I'm not in any pain right now. Um, I don't know if it's gonna if it's gonna grow. I have an MRI every six months, and I've had four of them so far, and it hasn't grown. So it may never grow. You know, I may die with these two things in my head. Um, but there are so many other people there who have so many other affirmities that I just wish there was a way of shining light on this. In particular, when I hear about things like the, uh, I think it's the Blue Water Vets, where these guys that are in the Navy, yep. and uh, they are getting compensation for being exposed in some way to uh, Agent Orange. Um, I have a, uh, a relative who um, was TDY at Tan Son Air Force Base in Vietnam. He was there for 90 days. He was a clerk, but he flew over on a C-130 and apparently the C-130s transported Agent Orange. Um, he was in the Air Force two years before I was in, so he was in, from, he was in, uh, in 64. And, uh, you know, God, God bless him, the guy, but the guy's an alcoholic. And um, he, uh, he, had a, uh, he had a heart attack. And so he went to the VA and he applied for, uh, for coverage. And he's got full disability. When I know, in fact, that that disability is all BS because he was an alcoholic. Uh, he was a heavy smoker. I never smoked. And he's getting compensation for it where... You know, he was a clerk in an office, and here are guys who were, you know, sitting on top of this stuff, uh, and they're getting denied left and right. That's what makes me angry. It's totally unfair. Yeah, the system is broken. It most definitely is. And I think it's important to talk to people like you and others who have that kind of story, because I think that's going to be relevant for people of my generation as well. Yeah. And I say that because plutonium, which was in the missiles that you speak of in the Thor rockets, uh, that has a half-life of 24,000 years. Yeah. So for 24,000 years, anything that that plutonium touches is radioactive. Mm -hmm. And the body cannot handle very much radioactivity. And it gets airborne when there's a nuclear explosion. The plutonium gets atomized. And then it settles into you know, the sand and the dirt, and then it picks up with the wind and it blows all over. What we're seeing in Iraq and in some places in Afghanistan is the same thing. And they think that that might be part of what's causing Gulf War syndrome um, because the amount of depleted uranium that we dropped on Saddam Hussein was very significant. We're talking tons and tons and hundreds and thousands of tons Depleted uranium is the number one go-to munition for the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Navy for things like Hellfire missiles, um, your cruise missiles, you know, so when we launch a cruise missile that has depleted uranium in it, and it's a very dense material, it's very good at punching holes in reinforced buildings, but when it explodes, it atomizes. And in, uh, in the case of Iraq, it settles into the sand and it gets blown around. And we're seeing a unusual amount of birth defects in Iraqi children. And they think that that's probably the cause, is the depleted uranium floating around the sand, blowing around, getting into people's lungs. Um, and it is transmitted 
from adults into children, you know, because it can be, it can be carried through sperm and things of that nature. So it's a very serious issue. And I think that my generation might have to deal with the same thing. So that's why I value this conversation so much is because talking to you and the things that you're telling me, they, they aren't, I guess they're not new for my generation, but your generation was the first to go through it. You know, Seth, I am shocked. I did not know that the munitions that were used in Iraq uh, contained uranium. Um, so this is news to me. And that being the case, once again, you know, I know that all you guys that were deployed over there, you know, you all volunteered. Uh, and, and you're all heroes. Um, that the government is turning a blind eye to some of the health issues that are developing as a result of this uranium um, is, is just unthinkable. It's, it's, it's deplorable. It's, it's just not right. And it needs to be taken care of. And so your generation, uh, I think so, so much more of your generation was exposed to this radioactive material than, than, uh, than, than previous generations, except for those of us that were involved with, with uh, these types of weapons. Um, I, I don't know at what point or if there's any group or if you've contacted or if you have groups of people that are in the same situation and you've contacted your congressman to try to find out or try to get a resolution. Um, you know, if, if you serve this country and you walk away, even 10, 20, 30, 50 years after you serve with some type of, uh, of uh, disability, you need to be compensated for it. It's not going to give back to you what you may have lost health-wise, but at least it's a recognition that your country is going to take care of you. Absolutely. You know, and, and it's funny that you mentioned that time frame you did, because from what I've read, it takes about that long for the effects of plutonium to really take its full course. So you might be completely healthy for 30 years, but once you hit 40 years, then right. you start showing symptoms. And once you hit 50 years past exposure, then it really kind of starts, you know, ramping up from there. So it's not something that ever goes away. Once you're exposed to it, it's in your body and it, it will not go away. Right. You know, it, it has a half-life of 24,000 years. It's, exactly. it's, you're not going to, pee it out it doesn't work like that <laughs> yeah yeah well again um uh you know i i think i i love my country and i i thoroughly and, and freely admit to joining the service but i am annoyed that those people who are responsible for uh, stepping up to protecting uh veterans uh you know, may not be doing all that they should be doing. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, even if, even if some of this stuff was, was hidden and even today is being hidden from the medical records because of this, this uh, uranium that, were, that was used in these uh, more modern weapons, um, I think people need to shine the light on it and just, you know, face up to it and uh, take responsibility and help those who need help, period. No, you're absolutely right. And I'm trying to do what I can to kind of get the ball rolling and spread the message where I can. And it's going to be tough. And a lot of it's going to require guys like you willing to speak up and speak out. You know, I've reached out to probably several dozen individuals from the Johnson Island group to see if they would be interesting and in, in talk. And so far, I only have two. I have you and I have one other gentleman who I will be interviewing later today. And they both served on Johnson Island. But I'd like to link you guys up at least. Um, you may already know each other. His name's Ron. Um, he's active in the groups as well. But I think that's how this thing works. Is you, you know when he was there? Uh, sorry, go ahead. You know when he was on JI? Uh, you know, I don't know the specific dates. I think he's younger than you are. So he probably would have been there in the 80s or early 90s. Okay. So kind of phase three. Probably he was affected more by, uh, you know, by some of the biological weapons in Agent Orange. Maybe some of the plutonium, I don't know what, you know what his job was, but I look at pictures of guys on J.I. as they're walking around the island in these spacesuits. You look at my picture walking around, I'm wearing short sleeve shirts and shower clogs. So there's a big difference in terms of you know, uh, what people knew and when they knew it. Uh, you know, 
be it while they were stationed on the island. So whatever you can do to shine light on it would be much appreciated. I think a lot of the guys, uh, I think they've reached a point where they feel like, uh, you know, it's pushing a boulder up a hill. I mean, how do you fight the government? And uh, you, you just have to be persistent. Whatever I can do to, uh, to help the, you know, the mission, because to me, it's a new mission. Not for me so much, but for you guys that were over in Iraq and that were exposed to any type of uranium contamination. I think it's abominable and uh, it needs to be uh, uh, admitted. And then uh, any way that they can find a way to, uh, to help you guys out, they should do it. No, I agree. And I want to thank you again so much for sharing your story with me. I'm sure it's probably not the easiest thing to talk about, but we're all in this together. And, you know, it's not a 1960s thing and it's not a 2019. It's, a, it's an American thing, you know, and we're Americans and this is, this is what we do. This is how it happens. So thank you very much. All right, Seth. I really appreciate the time. And uh, anything else I can do, you just please let me know. Yeah, I will do. Thank you. Thank you.